know, there sort of comes a time when you need to take a step back and, you know, have a good, hard, long look at yourself. I did that a little while ago. And I worked out I needed to find out what my sense of purpose was, or even if I had a sense of purpose. And I sort of discovered this weird duality in my character, this kind of weird polar extremes. I couldn't work out whether I was an absolute consummate underachiever or whether I was an overachiever, whether I had any aspirations whatsoever or whether I had too many aspirations. You know, this whole idea that I was doing so many different projects and, and had so many different interests and I wanted to grasp all of them that I couldn't actually focus on one. And I find it really interesting now, I'm working at the University of Newcastle and I work with researchers who are just so specialised in what they do. And I admire that so much and I sort of get jealous of it. And then I have to remember that there's something okay about being me and that is that, you know, I am the novice. And I found out when I was going through this kind of looking into myself, trying to get some kind of self-awareness, um, don't do it. It, very often it's quite confronting. Um, and then I heard about this man who is a corporate troubleshooter. So he gets sort of flown off and popped into various countries and has to sort of deal with sort of high level strategic issues, sort of hot issues, and he has to sort of come to some kind of negotiating point in them. And when asked what it was that he liked about this job, what he loved about it, he said, I actually like the very first stages of a project, those very first few moments where I feel like I'm drowning, where I can't possibly see how I'm going to solve this problem, how I'm going to swim to the surface. And when I heard that, I thought, my God, that's me. I get that. I love that. I love the idea of drowning. I love this idea that when I first start a project, when I first start something, I have to immerse myself in it because I can't possibly grasp it or understand it. And it's that first, that first stage that propels me through, th through things. And it's why I'm sure I have to start doing new things all the time, because I have to have that first stage. It's very addictive. I began my career as a novice when I joined the Orange Trout Acclimatisation Society in 1995. And I decided I was going to be the best dry fly trout angler in the Central West. <laughs> and I threw myself into this. I read everything there was to read about trout fishing. I learned how to um, do my own flies, tie my own flies. I studied up on the entomology of the area. Um, I bent the ear of anybody who was fishing. I even for a little while became the um, fly fishing reporter on a sports radio station in Canberra. <laughs> Weird, huh? In 1996, I was um, crowned, the, I like to say crowned, even though it wasn't that grand, the Orange Trout Acclimatisation Society's Novice Cup. And that, that fine trophy has kind of formed the motif of the next decade of my life. So I actually get, have to give a little backstory here. I actually finished a communications degree. I have finished a few things. Um, where I did journalism and writing and sort of um, creative writing was a big component of that as well and social and political theory. So I was doing a lot of writing and I was kind of getting frustrated because I wanted to make stuff. I wanted to use my hands and produce something tangible at the end of the day. And this is not an uncommon thing among writers and thinkers. And and I was hanging around, I got sidetracked from journalism. All my colleagues were very driven, you know, they're now foreign correspondents and, you know, you have to be absolutely driven. I was way too distracted. I had this thing where I had to have that first bit of everything, that first bite of everything. So I got really interested in art. So I was, I was getting very involved with the arts. I was getting sidetracked by boys with guitars and rock and roll in Sydney and all sorts of other things. And Hanging around with these artists and designers, I thought, I really wanted to, to, do, to make stuff. And I met some metal workers and that was it. So I became absolutely hooked on the idea of, of, of alchemy, of changing sort of, um, you know, the structure of metal, this seemingly unmovable thing and, and making it into something beautiful or a tool. So I decided I was going to learn a trade and I picked one of the hardest ones you can do, mostly because it's a dying trade 
and there aren't that many people around who do it. So I had to kind of go on this big mission, this investigative mission, to try and work out how I was going to do this. I was drowning in it and loving it. I decided to do a industrial blacksmithing trade, heavy metal fabrication. <laughs> yep. And I, I went down to, um, so I was living in Bathurst at the time and I travelled to Sydney to Ultimo one day a week where I did the trade. And um, it was kind of thrilling. It was kind of, I felt like I was part of a push, even though there were only probably six people doing it. Um, I think I spoke to every single blacksmith in the country. I joined every internet sort of chat group there is to do with it. Um, I met a handful of women that were working in the field and formed sort of long-standing, really fruitful, beautiful relationships with them. Um, and I sort of embarked on this extraordinary thing this weird thing. On the one hand, I was actually also working as a communications manager for an energy company, and they thought it was quite odd, this other cute thing that I was doing, and let me sort of go off and do it. And I was working in, in Bathurst, and I had my workshop in a funny little sort of rock-crushing plant outside of Bathurst. And the publican at the Perthville pub would send sort of people down to see that girl down in the rock-crushing plant, and I'd weld up bits of farm machinery and bash out a few bumper bars. And every now and then I'd take on a commission, a piece of furniture and architectural work, and I, I, I wouldn't know how to do it. I had no idea what I was doing. I'd say, yeah, sure, I can do that, yeah. <laughs> and then I'd have to go away and work out how to do it and, and make this thing. And that was part of the, the thrill of drowning. I was drowning in this thing and loving it. So 10 years ago I went to Melbourne, took myself off to Melbourne, and I was offered two jobs when I was in Melbourne in the same week. One of them was working for a communications company who sort of specialised in um, strategic communications, tricky infrastructure projects, government relations. It's the kind of thing I love as well. And then I was also offered a job as a blacksmith in one of Victoria's oldest forges, um, Loft and Sons they're called, and very old engineering firm. And the workshop was so seductive. It had these sort of four or five very sexy, large power hammers, and I love a power hammer. <laughs> and I just, I went back to Sean Dignam and Associates, which was the firm, and I sat down, I said, I need to talk to you about something. Can I come in and speak to you first? And I sat across the, the board table from Sean and a few of the other um, people that worked there, and I explained my situation, my little dilemma. And there was a bit of silence for a while as they kind of ticked over as to what exactly is this girl doing here. And then Sean piped up and said, well, I think you're certainly odd enough to work here. Why don't you go away, make a few tools, and then come back when you've got it out of your system? And that's exactly what I did. I went and worked in this extraordinary workshop for six months in the freezing cold Melbourne winter. I stood in front of a, you know, a blazing, disgustingly smelly diesel oil furnace all day long, working under a 500 weight Massey air hammer. I was making massive gooseneck crowbars, all sorts of weird tooling for industry, um, tongs and intricate little hammers, things that people can't buy off the shelf or from China. They have to be made. <clears throat> I was hardening and tempering tools. I was doing a lot of ornamental work because, you know, I was the girl, so give her the arty jobs, you know. <laughs> so one of the highlights was um, this extraordinary sort of intricate um, set of internal church gates that I had to make for an Anglican church in Paran. And they were really tricky. It was a really tricky job because they were really tiny little heritage forgings. You could only do them on the anvil couldn't do them on the power hammer, I tried. And little brass bits and pieces, and they were quite lovely. Very traditional forgings. And I stamped my initials in the bottom of those gates, and I know that one day, when I'm lucky enough to have grandchildren, I'll take them, show them what their kooky grandmother made. Um, it's the longevity, I love the longevity of it, and I love that balance, you know, having that sort of balance in my life, of being able to make things and think about things, and talk about things, and write about things at the same time. So then I took off my moleskins and my steel toe boots, and I went back to Sean Dignam, where I worked on very different projects for the next six months. It was probably one of the best working years of my life, because I had that extraordinary balance. So as a novice, I'm fully qualified. 
And there are three sort of essential criteria for a novice. One, ability to take on new challenges. Two, willingness to embrace risk. Three, capacity for humiliation. Now this is a very, very important thing. And this idea of humiliation sort of sows a thread through all the disparate pursuits. And I've only mentioned one of them here, too, trout fishing and that sort of thing. Different things that I've done. Because they actually are all connected and humiliation connects them all with my life as a writer. Um, there's an American poet and critic, Wayne Kaustenbaum, who's just released a book called Humiliation. And his his whole, this has kind of struck a nerve among writers, sort of everyone, everyone's talking about it at the moment. So it's with some humiliation that I admit I haven't read it, but I've read a lot about people who've read it. <laughs> so I kind of feel I have some authority on it. So basically he's putting forward the treaties that every act of reading and writing and, and art is an act of humiliation. And I can empathise with that. To be open to humiliation is a very, very necessary part of the process of being a novice. Siobhan, it's a lesson for you. Language, even trying to form language and write language is an exposure. And Kaustenbaum puts it like this. I'm nailed and buggered and stabbed by incubi and succubi. And each stab, each penetration, each pollulation is a phrase I try to turn into a complete sentence. So, all my crap writing, my bad worlds, my spectacular wipeouts in the surf, all qualify me as a novice. Even sitting across the table and admitting to Sean Digman that I wanted to reject his lucrative offer of employment and go and work in some kooky little workshop in Heidelberg was a humiliation. And because I find myself in a constant state of learning in these first few stages, in those first drowning moments of everything, I'm open to humiliation. I make mistakes all the time. I'm currently working very closely with an editor. I have a two-book deal, for, um, which is also um, working to a very, very tight deadline. So I'm writing very badly. I have to write quickly and I'm writing badly. And my editor does not hold back. So there is no room for preciousness in my life. I have to actually embrace that level of humiliation because I'll never move forward without it. So in his book, and I have to read this out, <laughs> Kaustenbaum puts forward a range of humiliations. Now, they're his personal humiliations, but they're all of ours. In fact, I was just in the loo and I had to catch myself when I came out because my fly was undone. I thought, well, that would be too cute. I could make that link. But I often catch, you know, you just got to make sure, you know, that it's not there. So Kirsten Berm says, having a tiny penis or any form of smallness, soiling oneself or virtually any other physical process, writing or being written about, being jealous, being cheated on, being Googled, being mistaken for the wrong gender, being Michael Jackson, electroshock therapy, impotence, hair loss, inadvertent erections in awkward circumstances, smelling like liverwurst, vomiting on stage before a musical performance, voyeuristic curiosity about death, failing to visit a dying colleague in the hospital and being photographed after you're dead. All humiliations. I think this is perhaps why I'm drawn to it. I think it's why I like writing the coming-of-age novel, where the protagonist sort of bumbles from one mistake, from one life inexperience to another, sort of on their journey towards some kind of self-awareness, where humiliation is the invoice you have to pay to actually get anywhere. And I think it's also why I'm drawn to those sort of classic American humorists like S.J. Perelman and David Sedaris and James Thurber, where, you know, I feel very comfortable in that world of sort of self-deprecation. And I've, I've learnt to live with humiliation because I have two daughters who are merciless. They will not let me sort of out the door during the day without planting a fruit sticker on my butt <laughs> or on the back of my head. I don't know. I go to work and here I am thinking I'm all shiny and corporate and my colleagues have been staring at my arse all day because there's like, you know... Kensington Pride mango sticker there. And, and looking at me like... <laughs> you know, I could never quite get it right. I've sat, in, I've sat at a board table, sort of high level, kind of, with lice. I could feel them <laughs> crawling in my hair. 
You know, the baby food drying on the lapel of my suit. You know, no matter how much I try, there is always something. So I just have to embrace it because it'll work its way into my writing at some stage or another. So, you know, I've been, you know, I've been told so many times that something is not good enough. You know, I've made mistakes and something is not good enough. And those three words, not good enough, they're like a drug. You know, I have to be the valedictorian of something, so I have to keep going until I get better at it. I have to keep swimming to the surface out of that point of drowning. And I know that that idea of drowning is the fuel for any novice. Thanks. <laughs>